Dear sirs, I'm writing to you about a miscarriage of justice that I faced. My situation is that I've been convicted of murdering my friend. Dear Louise Shorter, I was convicted in 2013 at the Old Bailey. I have always denied my involvement and maintained my innocence. Dear Louise, you may be able to help me. It's a wounding with intent. We get letters every week from prisoners who say they're innocent. Not all of them will be, but in amongst those letters, there will be people who are innocent of the crime they've been convicted of. We don't campaign on behalf of prisoners, but we contest their claims of innocence. So we are looking for any new piece of evidence that could get their case back to the Court of Appeal. Lynn Rosell was today found guilty of killing 41-year-old Linda Rosell. What turned out to be his last day of liberty, Rosell arrived still claiming he was innocent. What made this murder trial astonishing? There was no body. Despite a huge police search and public appeals for help, no trace of her has been found. It's as if Mrs Rosell has just disappeared into thin air. For 15 years, Glyn Rosell has said that he didn't murder his wife, that he's not guilty. Since his conviction, there have been stories, book chapters written, supporting his claims of innocence. Linda Rosell's body has never been found. There have always been question marks around the forensic evidence that convicted Glyn Rosell. And now, now suddenly, there are reports linking Linda Rosell to a double murder. Christopher Halliwell, a taxi driver from Swindon, serving a life sentence for murder. But were there more victims? This is somebody who murdered people in the same area that Linda Rosell went missing from, and that needs to be investigated. Inside Justice is essentially a panel of experts which reviews cases. We have barristers, solicitors, a retired judge, police detectives, forensic scientists, people across a whole raft of areas of specialism, all of them having years of experience in their field working on very high-profile murder cases. They've started to review the papers in the Glyn Rosell case to see if this really is a case for us. So thank you very much indeed, everyone, for being here today. Really good to see you all as ever. We are just discussing the one case today, and that is Glyn Rosell. He was convicted of the murder of his wife, Linda. They have four children, lived in Swindon. So she disappeared on the 19th of March, 2002. So a lot of searches, a lot of searches, a lot of methods, a lot of ways, and nobody ever found to this day. Prosecution case is that Glyn has abducted her down this alley. It's a busy alley, and there are lots of people that, that think they see her and nobody that can, can put him or anybody, anybody hanging around. It's a high-risk strategy of being seen, isn't it? Yeah. You know, it's, yeah. You, you're at commuter time, it's a busy cut-through for people, there's a part where there's potentially dog walkers. Why would you abduct somebody? Yeah. OK, so Christopher Halliwell, is a man who you may well have seen in the, in the press. He has been convicted of two murders from that area. Maslin. OK, a little bit about Halliwell. He pleaded guilty to the murder of a lady called Sean O'Callaghan in 2012. Uh, and he was found guilty of the murder of Becky Godden last year, 2016. The interesting information to link Halliwell 
to the result case comes from former Detective Superintendent Fulch. What Fulch has said... Guardian newspaper, 27th of September 2016. I'm not saying Halliwell has killed Linda Rizal. I'm saying that prospect has to be investigated. It's anecdotal that there is some suggestion that the two of them may have known each other. Surely the, the comments of a very senior investigating detective would prompt the CCRC to actually look at this more seriously. Um, the officer that Maslin mentioned, he's now parted ways with the force. All right, so I think this is a point where we should sort of really decide whether or not we are putting the resources of Inside Justice into this case. So I'd like the show of hands. Good. OK, thanks very much. So I'm not a lawyer, I'm not a police officer or a scientist, but I've been working in miscarriage justice cases now for the last 20 years. My background's in journalism. Part of the motivation for me is that I want to help an individual. If there's a person in prison who can't get help, might be innocent, I think they deserve help and they should get it. Glyn has previously applied to the Court of Appeal and that failed. He then went to the Criminal Cases Review Commission, the CCRC, the independent body which can refer cases back to the Court of Appeal. And he went to them in 2005 and asked them to refer his case to the Court of Appeal. And again, after their review, they refused to do that. So all the attempts he's made so far to get his case reheard have failed. But we know that there's work that we can do now which hasn't been done before. And if we find new evidence, we can put that to the CCRC. I've asked him to call me from prison. This will be the time when I can sort of get, try and get some sense of him, really. And that's him. Hello. Hello, this is Glenn Rizal. Hello. Hello. It is Glyn. Hello. Hi. Nice to talk to you. Likewise, yes. OK. All right. Um, you know, we don't campaign on behalf of people. We sort of review this really as if it's a cold case. Yes. Um, and we'll look for whatever evidence we can that will identify the killer. Yes. Are you, are you aware of that? Yes. What, what's your feeling about that? I'm grateful for any help I can get at the moment. I've been in prison now for uh, coming up to 14 years and, and I've had enough of it. I'm in prison with something I haven't done, uh, and I, I, I'm hoping that you'll be able to help. Well, I expect we'll have a series of calls, Glyn, um, and I am going to need to really push you on things. You know, I mean, a lot of people... Push, push away. That's yeah, fine. OK. That, that, that's, that's good. That's, that's absolutely fine. I know, you know, you must have been obviously asked this question many times over the years, but I, but for my own benefit, I want to ask you, did did you have anything to do with the with the disappearance, the murder of Linda Rizal? Nothing to do with her disappearance at all. And I don't know whether she's dead or not, for sure. OK. I, I don't know what more I can say, really. No, I, 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 I've, yeah. Um, you know, I've always just hoped she'd be found alive. Always. I imagine it's the same with everybody you know, that's got a missing person. You, you never really give up hope. Have you ever done a lie detector test? Polygraph? No, I haven't. Would you? Yes. The trouble, the trouble with, I, you know, I, I understand it will, give, it will give you confidence, but I don't think they work. Well, they are being used now by within the criminal justice system to keep people in prison. They are being used on sex offenders. I, I know they're being used on sex offenders, but I understood that the Ministry of Justice wouldn't allow serving prisoners to take a lie detector. Oh, no, 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 that's absolutely not true. But if you can get them, to, you know, if you can ask them, you, know, you might be able to, to get one past the governor here. And you would do that then if that was, if that was, if that was allowed at their yes. end? He comes across 
articulate, you know, former professional man who talks a good talk and is very clear. He hasn't done it. There's no sort of shimmy, shim, shimmying with him. There's no sort of dancing around language that I can detect at all. He's just very, very definitely, very clearly saying, I didn't have anything to do with it. I'm interested, though, in a way with why he's still pushing this. He, you know, he's coming towards the end of his sentence. He's potentially looking at, at being released within the next year or so. At, at this point, the very worst thing he can do is to keep saying, I didn't do it. With any case, we want to get all of the original trial papers. We want to look at the evidence that was put in court at the time of the trial, and we want to test that evidence. The prosecution case was that Glynn's motive for murdering Linda was financial. They were going through an acrimonious divorce after 17 years of marriage. The family court had frozen Glynn's bank accounts. The prosecution said, essentially, Glynn didn't want Linda to have his money. On the 19th of March 2002, they said that Glynn drove across Swindon in a car he borrowed from a friend and abducted Linda from this alleyway. He then murdered her and disposed of her body. Even now, to this day, Linda's body still hasn't been found. When Linda was last seen around five past nine in the morning, the prosecution said that Glynn had ample time to commit the murder because he can't prove where he was. His movements can't be accounted for. From 8.26 that morning until 2 o'clock in the afternoon. The strongest evidence against Glyn at trial was that Linda's blood was found in the car Glyn had been driving. Now, Glyn's defence was that Linda had staged her own disappearance. He claimed that she was still alive. And he pointed out that Linda's blood wasn't found in the car until the third time it was searched. And so his suggestion was that it must have been planted. So my starting point is going to be the scene of the crime. Linda's gone missing on the 19th. We know that, that Linda would have driven down this road here and she turns into this alley, which you can drive down, just sort of width of one car, and then comes into this little close, goes here and parks up there. Linda Rizal parked her car here in Alvescoth Road in Swindon every morning. She did the same on Tuesday. It's just a short walk to Swindon College where she worked. She never arrived. At 10 to 9, she left Kings Avenue in Highworth and arrived in Alvescott Road 20 minutes later. And it's thought she walked down this alleyway on her way to work, but she was never seen again. We know Linda was running late that morning on her way to work. The key prosecution witness lived in Alvescott Road. This is the road here. And he said that he saw Linda that morning between 5 past and 10 past 9 and that he'd opened his driveway gate and then had reversed out and got to the top of the alley and driven down. And by the time he got there, Linda, he said, was completely gone. So the prosecution estimated this gave Glynn just over one minute to abduct Linda, which is obviously very tight. The key thing, though, is that nobody saw Linda being abducted at all, but her mobile was found just by some garages here. And so the fact that her mobile was found was the reason that the police and prosecution believed that she was abducted from this alleyway itself. For me, there are lots of questions around the alley as an abduction site. So I need to go to Swindon and I need to see it. But I need to be there at exactly the same time that Linda was last seen there, between 5 and 10 past 9 in the morning. Jill. Hi, 
Louise. Nice to see you. Oh, it's really nice to see you again. Thanks too. for coming up. It does help to visit a scene to get a feel for what's allegedly went on. Could things have happened the way they're supposed to have happened or the way that the story's unfolding? It just puts everything in perspective, as opposed to just either seeing a photograph or even seeing a video. It's not the same as actually being there. So the police find her mobile phone. Here it is. This is just, just here by these garages face down and it's partly covered by this piece of wood. And it just seemed an odd position for it to be in. The location of the phone is downright weird, isn't yes, it? Yes, it is. There are all these other bits of rubble and debris and builder stuff all over the place in yeah. the foreground. Yeah. And it somehow has managed to sort of get past all of those. Yes. And then tuck itself under, partly underneath the plank of wood. It does seem odd. Of windows overlooking, you wouldn't possibly think this is a very good abduction site, surely. It wouldn't be my first choice. No. That's interesting. Look, see this crocodile of school children going yeah. across there. Yeah. See how busy it is. Yes, it is. It just seems to be a vulnerable area to abduct somebody. Vulnerable to the person who's been abducted? Uh, no, vulnerable to the person who's going to be doing the abduction because it's a busy area. If you're doing it in the middle of the night or something like that, but at 9 o'clock in the morning at that time, it's just hard to take somebody physically off a street and get them to disappear without someone hearing or seeing something. <laughs> I do think that the alley is an odd abduction site, but what we know for a fact is that it's the last place that Linda was seen alive between five and 10 past nine in the morning. So the next thing I need to do is to look at Glyn's window of opportunity. Could he have got to the alleyway by five past nine in time to abduct Linda? So on the morning that Linda disappeared, Glyn got a call at his house at 8.24 on his landline. That call lasted one minute and 43 seconds. And that fixed him at home at 8.26 that morning. His house was over here, so that was three miles from the alleyway. The police drove what they say would have been his journey. And they started that journey soon after the call to his landline would have finished so that they could recreate it in similar traffic conditions. Time on the uh, video clock. Okay, it's 8.30, setting off on the journey now. So on the day, Glyn had swapped cars with a friend who needed a bigger vehicle to go on the booze cruise. So Glyn was driving his friend's Renault Laguna. Turning into Alfscott Road at exactly 8.43. So it took them just under 15 minutes to make that journey by their timings. So that would have left Glyn around 20 minutes to spare before Linda arrived then between 5 and 10 past 9. At the Alscott Road end of the lane at 8.43 and 23 seconds. Tape concluded. So theoretically, we know that Glyn could have got across town in time that day to abduct Linda, but there are some really puzzling questions around all of that. Linda would normally have been at the alley for 10 to 9, but she was running late that day. He had no way of knowing that Linda was running late that morning, and nobody reported seeing him hanging around the alley waiting for her. The prosecution painted Glyn as this absolutely meticulous planner but if Linda had been on time that day, he would have been cutting it very fine indeed to have been in the alley when she was walking through. A lot of police time was obviously put into trying to find CCTV that could put that Laguna that he was driving in Swindon Town Centre. But despite intensive police searches, 
The police couldn't find a single piece of footage that would put that car on the roads of Swindon on that morning that Linda disappeared. OK, talk me through what you were doing the morning that Linda disappeared, would you? I know Rachel, your girlfriend at the time, wasn't staying with you that night. I'd got up on my own uh, um, about half past seven uh, and got dressed, had breakfast. I put petrol in the car. I then went back home again and then Rachel phoned. And that's really important because it's the 8.24 phone call that alibis me firmly at my house at that time, because if I had been going to intercept Linda on her way to work, I'd have left by then. Yeah. And, and can, can, I, can I just add to that, how could I have got the car past all the CCTV cameras to the abduction site and then out of Swindon, presumably past more CCTV cameras, um, to some sort of, well, the, the police are saying dumped in the Wiltshire countryside somewhere. So if he wasn't abducting Linda in the alley, where was he that morning? He says after the 8.24 phone call, he did some paperwork at home and then went for a two-hour walk. But Glyn's mobile phone was off, so the police couldn't use cell site information to track his movements. The police believe that he'd switched his mobile off deliberately. When you were on the walk, was your phone switched on throughout the time you were on the walk? It should have been switched on, but sometimes uh, it switches itself off automatically. Sometimes your phone switches itself off. Did you check? I checked it later. I don't remember checking it on the route. What about on the way back? I don't remember checking what I was out at all. It strikes me as a bit strange. It doesn't do it all the time. You know, it's not one of those things where you have to keep on checking. Glyn has continued to insist that his phone had a fault and would accidentally switch itself off. An expert was called in for the prosecution to test that theory. He found that Glyn's phone did sometimes switch itself off but only when it was in a tight pocket. Given that he'd been on a long walk through a park, the police said that the shoes he was wearing were suspiciously clean. Uh, he said that his, he cleaned his, any mud from his shoes off by walking in a circle in long grass outside of his house. And when the police went, there was a flattened circular area outside his house. Glyn's alibi might sound pretty weak, really. It's a long walk alone around a park with no mobile phone signal to verify it. But there is one important detail about that walk that I need to find out more about. So I'm meeting his solicitor from the time of the trial. Good to see Robbie Ross. Okay. Be short. Hello. Are you, are you Robbie? Yeah. Hello, I'm Louise right. Shorter. Hiya. Nice to meet right, you. Yeah. Can you show me now then, Robbie, where he said he walked? He would have walked along here, yeah. having come from the Mannington roundabout over there. OK, right he'd on come, this road. He'd have come from there, because he was living maybe half a mile from where we are standing now. Yeah. And he would have walked along here because he was going to take the path that dips down just past that bus stop. Yep. Now, that bus stop is opposite where Wesley Police Station was. Right. Where this large block of, um, sort of... Flats. Monstrosity flats are, <laughs> this was the police station. There you can see Wesley Police Station. So we're here, we're here, we're over we? here. Yeah. I remember when he told me that he walked past Wesley Police Station, I said to him, you know, well, we're not going to have a problem, are we? Because there's cameras on, you know? And it was only later that we found out that they were either 
either dummies or they weren't working at all. He could not have known that that camera was either redundant or just not working no. that day. So if he was falsely creating for himself an alibi... He wouldn't have mentioned he it. He wouldn't have said, I walked He'd have said, I walked down there. No, you'd have picked an entirely different route. I'm, I've always been utterly convinced of the fact that he did that walk and he went past that police station because you do not walk into the lion's den, put your mouth in the lion's mouth, put your head in the lion's mouth and say something that might screw you. It would have been an utterly stupid thing to do. Yeah. He might be a lot of things, but he was not and is not stupid. Although I talk to him on the phone, I find it quite hard to get a sense of what he's really like. Tell me about him. What was he like as a person then? We got to know Glyn Rizal probably better than his bloody mother did at the time. If he was guilty of this, the way that he carried himself from the minute I got him bailed to the minute he was locked up, I would have expected him to give something away. You know, there might have been a little nuanced move, something he might have said, let slip out, just something very, very minor. A look, even, you know, nothing. There was absolutely nothing that led me to believe that what he was telling me wasn't true. I think it's quite likely, as he's always said, that she decided to make a new life for herself. A week on and still no clues as to what happened to Linda Rizal. Police released images from CCTV of Mrs Rizal in the HSBC bank in Swindon, taken the day before she disappeared. What did happen to your wife? I don't know what's happened to Linda. I believe that she's gone off of her own free will. Police investigations so far have drawn a blank. They say it's as if Mrs Rizal has just disappeared into thin air. If your wife, as you say, is still alive, why hasn't she contacted her children? She knows that she will be in a lot of trouble um, for uh, the, the problems that she's caused for me and, indeed, the amount of time that the police have spent on this. Glyn's defence has always been that Linda staged her own disappearance in order to start a new life. So I'd like to look at whether this is a possibility. Linda was originally from South Wales. She met Glyn when she was on the train when she was 20 years old. They got married, they had uh, um, four children, the marriage broke down 17 years later, and then they began divorce proceedings in the year 2000. At the time she went missing two years later, both she and Glyn were in new relationships. She was working part-time as a teaching assistant. She was 41. At the time of her trial, you think that Linda had disappeared. Yes, that's, that was your... That was your theory, was it, Glyn? Is that right? If as long as there's no body found, then you know, there's got to be a reasonable chance that she's still alive. The sort of theories I've been working around were that uh, you know, she, she planned to disappear, she planted the blood, uh, expected me to be arrested immediately, uh, and then planned perhaps to turn up a couple of days later, um, bloodied and bruised, claiming I'd abducted her. And I would then you know, be up for, tr for, for trial for, I don't know what, false imprisonment or something. But she wouldn't have left your children, though, surely? I mean, I can't... I, I, you know, I, I read what your defence was and I, I think I'm, I'm surprised, really, that that was the defence that you ran because, because there were so many people that, was, that would say she, you know, she just wouldn't do that, she wouldn't leave her children like that. Well, uh, and the, 
and, and the troll barrister made a, a big thing about it as well. It's just, you know, mothers don't leave their children. But the, I don't know. Don't you think the idea she's disappeared is just too far-fetched? I think that the idea she's disappeared is extraordinary. And I think it is certainly takes quite a lot to, you know, to sort of really get your head around that and to think, could that possibly be true? But I think you also have to give Glyn, cut Glyn a bit of slack here. You know, if he hasn't murdered his wife, then he is just trying to read between the lines and come up with some theory as to what might have happened. The public are being asked for their help in the search for Linda Rizal. Specially commissioned posters like this are being placed along her route that Tuesday morning. Over a week of searching has only yielded one clue, and that's Linda's mobile phone. Her bank accounts haven't even been touched. Her ex-husband has now joined the growing list of people appealing for her to get in touch. He says Linda has gone missing before, but has never left the children. Please come forward. Please just at least let us know that you're safe. Divers have been searching ponds and waterways along Mrs. Rizal's route to work. It's really rare to have a case when somebody has been convicted of murder when nobody has been found. An expert from the Inside Justice Advisory Panel has been going through all the proof of life work the police did to see whether Linda really could be alive and in hiding somewhere. Hello, Sam. Nice spot you found yourself. Good to see you. Hi, you too. So this is the park then that, that would have yes. been on Linda's route if she continued yes. on her way to work. You've been working predominantly, haven't you, on the searches? I've been having a look at the searches, yeah. I think it's very difficult to completely disappear without trace. Even up to, you know, 10, 15 years ago, that was still a difficult thing to do. Someone normally leaves a trace, whether that's through using banking facilities, telephones, through travel, or contact with family, friends, visiting places that they used to frequent. When Linda first went as a missing person, she was, um, you know, they treated it very much so, and the helicopter was up and the dogs were out, and this particular location, fingertip searching, really? underwater searching, so... Gosh, this is a big area, it's, isn't it, to it's, do a fingertip search? It's a huge area with, um, with really difficult terrain. So what did they find from the searches here? So, um, nothing found. When you get a case of a nobody murder, you have to do everything you possibly can to try and establish whether that person is still alive. So obviously that's checking uh, bank accounts, utilities, passport, etc. No um, passports have been issued or, or reissued. The last passport that was issued was 1994, I think it was. was. It? So for, for Linda, and that was her last passport. Um, so Interpol. Interpol, yeah. So DBA, inquiries. DBLA. Yeah, inquiries abroad. They've done a lot, haven't they? They've, they've done a lot. Is it possible for someone to disappear without any form of financial backing, you know, somewhere to live, the ability to... a, a means to live? Possibly, but I think they've done quite an extensive job on the proof of life inquiries. So, so what, are you, what are your feelings overall, then? Um, I would... I, if I was... Yeah, going to give an answer, I would say that Linda Rizal isn't alive anymore. This interview's being tape recorded. You arrested earlier today, uh, Mr. Rizal, um, on suspicion of the murder of your wife, Linda Rizal. And the reasons that was done was because there was inconsistencies that we've established in the account that you've given to us. Do you understand? Yes. Well, Glyn was first arrested on suspicion of murder eight days after Linda went missing, partly because of inconsistencies in his story. 
The day after Linda disappeared, the police, in the normal way, asked him for the clothing that he'd been wearing the day she went missing. He handed over a pair of black trousers and a purple shirt and black coat, and then the police then went and checked his movements that day. And one of the things he'd said he'd done was that he'd come to this petrol station, which was just over here, just about 8 o'clock in the morning, and had filled up with petrol. So they got the CCTV footage from that, which is this. And, of course, what they noticed immediately is that he's not wearing black trousers, as he said, but he's got on these very light colour jeans, normal pale blue jeans. In relation to the clothing, it's my understanding that a pair of jeans recovered from your house is in fact being washed and dried. I need to ask you if there's any sort of sinister reason why deliberately gave them from our trousers. Of course, there isn't any sinister reason. I don't, I don't have any further plans to make. By the time the police took the actual jeans that Glyn had been wearing, eight days after Linda's disappearance, they had been washed and the police didn't find any blood on them. The police also searched Glyn's house extensively, looking for traces of Linda's blood, but found nothing. He said that he originally gave police the wrong trousers just because it was an innocent mistake. He'd got home from his walk, he'd had a bath and changed into, into some other clothes, some black jeans. And we can see in this still from the CCTV here from later on that evening that actually he was wearing those, those clothes, the black jeans. I don't think you can afford to think, well, that looks a little bit odd and that looks a little bit odd, so therefore he must have done it. I think that's really dangerous. I think you have to look at what are the, what are the really strong pieces of evidence um, and does that piece of evidence still stand? Is that piece of evidence really solid? So if you, you know, I, I always, whenever we're looking at cases, our approach is always to think, what's the very best thing the prosecution had? The blood evidence from the boot of the car, that was the reason why Glyn was eventually charged. We need to re-examine that to see whether that evidence stands up. Can I take you back to the Renault Laguna? In the words of the forensic scientist, there's heavy blood stain. Just wanted to reinforce that to you. It's heavy. So on the day Linda was missing, Glyn was driving a friend's car, not his own car, and that was a Renault Laguna. The police searched that car three times over eight days before they found any blood in it at all. And they found blood in four areas of the car. They found it on the um, on the sides of the boot, these areas here where it's circled. They said they found blood on the edge of the boot. They found it on the footwell mat, you see here, where there's some blood here. And they found it on the underside of the parcel shelf in these little spots where the diagram shows. Glyn has always said it's suspicious that it took the police and the scientists so long to find that blood. Yeah, and but the, the trouble is, I mean, I've been been poring over those those various blood reports over the last few days, as you can imagine. Yes. And the I mean, the blood in the Laguna evidence appears to be very strong, doesn't it? Yes, it's that it's that evidence alone that has got me convicted. Yeah, you had the car, and her blood apparently is found in that car. I I, I can understand why the jury convicted, can't you? Yes, of course I can. Yes, unless we can show that the evidence they were given um, was flawed then I don't think the CCRC or the appeal court will have any truck with it. 
No, I agree with you. I don't think they will in the slightest. I, I think uh, the blood wasn't in the car when the police did their first examinations of it. Yeah. Uh, I think the blood was put in the car after it was given back to my the friend whose car it was. Glyn is claiming that Linda, or at least somebody helping her, put her blood in the car to frame him. So I need to go and talk to our forensic experts to ask if they can tell when the blood got there and why it took so long for the blood to be found. Really, the devil is in the detail, and we need to focus in on that. The smallest of detail within it could actually provide huge significance in terms of interpretation. If you look at the things that weren't examined, for example, then that can give you a very clear picture as to what other opportunities might be available. This is a Laguna, um, same, I think, make model as the one that's in the, in the case. Mm -hmm. um, so we were just going to try and understand um, the kind of the logistics of examining it for blood, really. My understanding is that on the 20th of March, um, this car was examined whilst it was parked at the owner's address, and the crime scene examiner conducted a, essentially a visual search for blood and, where possible, used some forensic light source. 40 minutes later, the examination is complete. You know, the, the examiner's in here with a light trying to see if there's blood and doesn't see anything. How could it possibly be missed? He notes that and the weather conditions weren't that great. I think it was raining. Yeah. It was certainly dark. So far from ideal conditions. And you can kind of imagine him, can't you, on the drive with the sheet and then the torch in your other hand and I can't see anything. Precisely. If you see a photograph of the boot area of this car further down the line and the amount of blood that was found, it seems absolutely incredulous that you would look at this with the forensic light sources that he has mm -hmm. and not see it. But it, the reality of it is it was dark, funny lighting conditions. You've got to actually visually look and, and properly inspect But, is, but that that's surface. what they were supposed to be doing during their search, isn't it? Precisely. Looking we just it. don't know if that actually happened. And then, the th and then the next day, they decide they're going to take the, the car into the police garage. During that examination, they're recovering effectively trace evidence. Essentially, it's almost like your regular vacuum cleaner. They recover hooverings from in the main um, cab of the vehicle, but also specifically from the boot. And at that point, the car then goes back to the owner. That's right. Um, there's a suggestion that the, the owner um, conducted some form of cleaning on it. It's not clear exactly what, how thorough that was. And then they decide to take the car back in again. So, yeah, this is one week later. It, the car is subjected to a luminol examination. Mm -hmm. And luminol is a chemical that we use to um, detect any traces of blood that aren't readily visible to the right. naked eye. It's a, it's a very sensitive um, chemical and blood in terms of discrete stains were found. And that and the position of those stains was um, reflected in a sketch. We've printed that so you can get an actual reflection oh, of the blood stain on the back of the parcel shelf. Brilliant. None of this blood stain is indicative of a specific action. So that means that all we can say is the boot has been exposed to a source of blood but when precisely it got there, mm -hmm. we simply can't say. I mean, you've been arrested on suspicion of murder, haven't you? Yes, sir. So there's, there's no doubt in your mind about that? No. And that now, when we've informed you of all the, all the blood in the boot of that car, you can't offer us any explanation that it got there? Of course I can't. So it was nothing. I wasn't there. I don't know how it got there. There isn't any more I can say. For the entire time that Glyn Vazell has been in prison, for the last 15 years, he's able to say, yes, but they searched the car twice and didn't find anything. 
How can we ever actually find out whether or not the blood was there all along? Yeah. Or if it only appeared after the second search? Well, I think that's when we go back to the hooverings that were recovered from the boot area. OK. Because the, the records suggest that these hooverings have never been examined, so mm -hmm. they're, they're essentially untested. And if the hooverings took place and the blood that we now see had been in the boot at that level, then the hooverings would essentially have collected some of that blood. And had they never been tested? No. Why not? I presume what may have happened is that during the course of the examination, the actual visible blood was found in the boot area. And so at that stage, a decision was made, well, on that basis, we'll put the hooverings to one side because they're no longer a priority. Brilliant. So now we've, you know, but now finally got a way of saying, OK, well, let's tell for sure whether or not it was there all along or not. Hello. Hello, it's Glenn Russell. Hello, Glenn. Hello. Thanks for phoning. How are you? I'm OK, thank you. Yourself? Good. Yes, very well. Thanks very much. Good. The, the, the strategy is that your theory, as I understand it, has always been that the blood was planted in the boot yes. after the car was given back to its owner. Yes. OK, so the strategy that's been suggested is that we should get access to the hooverings that were taken from the very early searches and we should then do work on those hooverings to see whether or not there's blood in them. OK. What do you think of that? Brilliant. I think that's an excellent idea. If we find that there, there, was, there is blood in those hooverings, that will show categorically that the blood was always there. Uh, I, I don't agree with that. Um, if, if the blood was there at the earlier checks, that doesn't mean to say it wasn't planted. It just means it was planted before the... When would that be, though? But that, would, but that would be when the car was in your, your possession. You know, how, how and when and, and why, how... You know, could, could anybody, could somebody have planted it at that, at that early stage before...? Uh, uh... I, I, I agree. I, I agree. I don't know, I don't know when. You know, I, I think it's most likely that the blood was planted after the Laguna was given back. I've always thought that. I, I, and I have to sort of be totally upfront about it. I, I have to say that, that you know, if we did that work and we then got those hooverings back and, and there was blood in them, I, I think that would be a real problem for me. You know, I think I would look at the case and, see, and say, well, look, there you are, you see, the blood was there all along. They just messed up. Their search was very poor and they just didn't find it. Well, I know I didn't kill her. And I, and I know she wasn't in the boot of the car while I had the car. So I've got an advantage uh, over the experts. All right. OK. Bye-bye, Glenn. Bye. Rizal's family and friends left court relieved with a guilty verdict, but angry that Glyn Rizal had spent the last 18 months walking free on bail, the devastating effect on the couple's children. Linda's greatest fear was leaving her children without a mother, and Glyn Rizal knew this. Linda was described in court by her friends and family who knew her well uh, as a bright and professional woman who was utterly devoted to her children. They couldn't imagine that Linda would have left her children voluntarily. I've written to quite a few of Linda's friends and family, her closest family, and I've been getting phone calls and emails. They're all convinced that Glyn is guilty of the murder and that the jury made the right decision. A local newspaper at the time had reported that there had been allegations of violence in the marriage. 
Lim went to court twice on domestic violence charges and on both of those occasions he was acquitted. Now that evidence never went into court against him at the time of the murder trial, but even so, we at Inside Justice need to know more about those allegations. Um, do, do you have any contact with the children now? No. Have they always believed that you're guilty? Yes, yes. Um, I had a, a trial uh, in February 2002, uh, just a few weeks before Linda disappeared. She told the police that I'd assaulted her and I was acquitted. What did happen? Linda obstructed my exit from the house and I just went to um, gently move her out of the way. I put my hand on her arm and sort of brush her aside. She weighs about half of what I did then. Um, and she went through a glass door panel. Uh, and uh, my hand was cut and her head was cut. Uh, and um, I was charged with Section 20 for that. I have to tell you, Glyn, that the, the, telling, the retelling of that doesn't come across well. No. You know, you mean you're saying, you know, my hand was on her arm, I, I simply brushed her to one side and then she went through a glass panel. I mean, you know, that, that sort of absolutely smacks of the old, you know, she tripped. So I don't know, and she said something to try to goad me. I can't recall what it was. Uh, I, have it, I have it written down. Oh, I can't believe that you don't remember what it was. You remember this, de this scene in absolute minute, de minute detail and you're telling me you can't remember what she said. You're pathetic, I think that, those were her words, just um, to goad me. And then what happened? You see, from from my point of view, Glyn, I'm 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 very I'm very glad that you've just shared that with me, and I do I do hope you will, you will continue just being completely honest, but 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 I have to say, but I have to say, from my point of view, um, you t you telling me that that she'd made allegations that you've been violent towards her, and she told friends that you've been violent towards her makes me that that sort of makes me feel very anxious about whether or not you have been violent towards in the past. Yes. Um, I well, what can I say? There isn't anything being hidden there. Good, good. Can you can you see how that looks? Well, of course I can. That's why I'm in prison. No, that, that's why I became a police suspect uh, from the off. I, I, I'm not the guilty party here. I was wronged from the outset with, with these false allegations. When you hear evidence like the GBH, it must, it must shake you. It shakes me, yes, of course it shakes me. No two ways about it, I find that really difficult. The fact it's violence within the relationship, that's a real worry, isn't it? Because if you've got a, a building picture of there being disharmony between the two of them and him being aggressive, then it's not much of a leap, is it, to think, well, did it all finally erupt one day? So I do, I do find that really hard. It's six o'clock on Monday, the 26th of September. Good morning, this is Today with Sarah Montague. But now there's another theory circulating around this case. It's one of the reasons we started looking at it in the first place. When a judge was sentencing Christopher Halliwell last week for the murder of Becky Godden, he said, but for your confession, I have no doubt Becky's remains would never have been found. That confession was made to the Wiltshire police officer, Steve Fulcher, and he's here in the studio now. Good morning to you. Good morning. Are there other g girls, women who have been killed who you think he was... There are, unquestionably. I mean, I spent a lot of time with Christopher Halliwell. We were aware, particularly, of Linda Rozelle. She had a direct relationship with Halliwell. I've been in touch with Glyn's sister, Vicky. She's always believed that her brother is innocent, and now she thinks this new Halliwell connection is pretty compelling. Hello, oh, Vicky. Hi, Louise. Nice to see you. Come in. Thank you very much. In the kitchen? Yeah, please. So when that guilty verdict came in, yeah, right back then, 14 years ago, 
Did, what did you feel in that moment about whether Glyn was guilty or innocent in your pit of your stomach? I always felt he was innocent pit of my stomach. Um, for the person that I knew, the person I grew up with, the upbringing that we had and who we are as a, as, as a family and as individuals. I don't think my brother killed his wife. Um, you always hope that something's going to happen that, that helps you find out what actually happened. You know, something will come to light. Recently, um, Halliwell has come into um, the picture and that's put a complete new light on things and you start to look at, at circumstances, situations or, or lines of events and actually it makes a lot of sense that he could be responsible for Linda's disappearance. My other brother and I uh, went to visit Glyn in prison and said to you, you know, it, it looks as if there is a possibility at this stage that Halliwell is involved in Linda's disappearance. And Glyn's reaction to that was to burst into tears. And his reaction was, I always thought we'd find her alive. That reaction you could not make up. So he... Literally, genuinely, not only I mean genuinely, but yeah, he, he literally he burst, burst into, into tears, tears yeah. In his mind, he's not responsible... In his mind, he's not responsible for her death and he believes she's disappeared of her own accord and is on and living somewhere else. So, for the first time, he was thinking about what may have happened that didn't involve her going away of her own accord. And it was such a genuine... Reaction. Um, no, you couldn't make that up. What this potential witness has said is that Halliwell formed this sexual relationship, became obsessed with Linda. I've lost my career over this case. But you don't have to be a detective, a policeman, or even have a double-digit IQ to work out, there's a line of investigation there. Police in Swindon have begun excavation work at the former home of Christopher Halliwell, who's serving a life sentence for the murder of two young women. Hello, it's Glyn Rizal here. Hello, Glyn. So, um, I've had a letter from the prison, and they've approved the uh, polygraph, the lie detector. How confident are you that, that, that by the end of the day, when you come back, you're going to be able to tell me whether or not he has killed her? Good examiners, which I am, should be hitting round about mid-90s. Glyn Rizal has always said the only explanation he can think of is that Linda planted the blood herself. What do you make of the blood in the boot? 